Um, welcome to tonight's open classroom. Uh, the title is The Political Landscape. We talked about uh, the media landscape last, uh, last week, I think, in a really interesting um, session that uh, Jill Abramson, uh, Professor Abramson, had arranged for us. Uh, we're now going to look at the politics as 2024 approaches. Um, and I think we've got a great panel to talk about this. While everyone's talking, you know, we'll give them a chance to talk initially, and then um, we'll move to your questions. So please be thinking of what you would like to know. Um, so uh, in the center here is Professor Maria Elena Villar. She's the head of the Communication Studies Department, um, but also has moved up here from Miami. And while she was in Miami, um, she was looking at the role of Hispanic media and voting, questions of disinformation, um, and also just in general getting a sense of the um, Hispanic population uh, in Florida, uh, how it's dividing, how it's changing, and what that may say about Hispanics nationally. <clears throat> in class, we were talking about the erosion in support among Hispanics for Biden and for Democrats and how that's kind of messing up some of the Democratic calculations. Um, next to her is a student, uh, uh, Bella Mueva, um, who has been doing some research for Professor Abramson looking at uh, younger uh, people and activism, um, looking at Students for Life, the um, pro-life group, uh, the Sunrise uh, Movement, which has gotten a lot of attention, and efforts uh, to push gun control. And she'll kind of be talking a little bit about how those groups are organizing their effectiveness um, and so forth. Then joining us by Zoom, uh, we have Professor Abramson, um, former editor of the New York Times, who was in Washington for many years before she moved to New York and was directing coverage on, uh, on all these issues. Um, and then we have uh, Professor Seth Harris, um, who I'm surprised is not wearing his union hat or your buttons or something. Uh, uh, Professor Harris um, has a long background uh, in Washington um, as a Democrat, as a policy advisor, he was uh, President Obama's acting Secretary of Labor, and he was also um, uh, a top aide to Joe Biden in the White House, a job he left about a year ago, I'm guessing. Is that about right, Seth? And, um, and, um, but still sort of stays in touch. Uh, uh, Seth can speak to this, that Biden always feels he's being underestimated and that this election coming up may not be um, as, uh, as, as worrisome for Democrats as, as Democrats think. Um, Seth is also um, very involved in kind of union issues and the role of labor in this country. Uh, he's gonna make a pitch probably at the end about a blog he started, um, but union labor issues, which seem to be pretty quiescent for a while, mm -hmm. have clearly roared back with the 20 for $20 minimum wage movement, unionization at Starbucks uh, here at Northeastern. Our grad students will be voting whether or not to organize, uh, I believe, next week. And of course, we have the UAW strike. So this is kind of a group, union voters, which I think we haven't thought about much or talked about much in recent years. But um, it'll be interesting to hear what he has to say. Um, Professor Ted Landsmark is here as well, who uh, is in charge of the open classroom. And I think we will both sit up here and um, start things off with a few questions and then um, turn it over to you to ask some questions. So, um, Professor Villar, let me ask you first if you could talk a little bit about your background and then your impressions um, and kind of insights into Hispanic voters, but especially what the hell's going on in Florida. I will try. Hi, everyone. My name is, so I'm Maria Elena Villar. I'm originally from Puerto Rico, um, but I've lived, I lived in Miami for 25 years before moving here a year ago. And, um, you know, I saw personally a lot of change in, in what was happening. So my remarks and what, what, I, what you hear me say are, come from several perspectives. One, as a communication scholar that studies strategic communication, political communication, and kind of so, com, social change communication, but also as a member of the Latino Hispanic community in South Florida, and um, also as someone who isn't 
very pleased with all the changes that are happening now. So all those things go through a lot of filters, right? But so what have I noticed? What I noticed when I first, um, you know, 25, 30 years ago, the most of the Hispanic population in Florida were Cuban exiles that were, you know, very much affected by the revolution and had very strong opinions and they were kind of reactionary against anything that sounded like left because of that. Um, then there were different waves. So there was the, the idea that, um, you know, that was also a community that was very financially, quickly became financially important. So they had influence that way. So in that way, there was that initial group of Hispanics, white Hispanics in in South Florida that were likely to vote Democrat. They never, for, will never forget the Bay of Pigs <laughs> and things like that, right? So, um, but then in the 90s and 2000s, you ha we had a big influx of immigrants from all over Latin America, a lot from Central America, you know, fleeing economic hardship, different kinds of political uh, upheaval and things like that. And it was a little more diverse. And the Cubans that were arriving were also people that grew up in the revolution. So um, they had, you know, there were things about it that they found positive. So that was a little bit more, um, you know, diverse, I would say. And, and, you know, perhaps the economic arguments of the Democratic side and the pro-immigration support of the Democratic side was a little more attractive. But um, things have changed in recent years, right? With the rise of Trump politics and things like that. Um, the fear of socialism <laughs> has been a really important talking point, right? So we have people in South Florida that have very legitimate trauma um, from left-wing dictatorships, right? In, uh, in Cuba and Venezuela and Nicaragua and just uh, bad experiences that have really been harmful to them and situations that have made those countries um, very difficult to live in now. And so any, you know, making the, the argument that something sounds like socialism or something sounds like the government is telling regular people what to do is a very effective um, argument. So I think that the you know, Republicans have really been able to use that argument really well in terms of strategic communication. And then I think that another uh, an, another factor is the rise of evangelicals um, kind of becoming more political actors. I'm from Puerto Rico, and even in Puerto Rico that is traditionally kind of democratic, um, we see that being a factor. You talk about why, why, why is the evangelical piece of it? Because, I mean, most Latinos, those who practice or are active, tend to be Catholic, right? But is that changing too? Um, I think the the proportion might be changing somewhat, but I think the difference is the 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 kind of becoming active in politics is what's a little bit different, right? Where before, I don't think that um, you know, I think Hispanics had their church and their Catholic church, and that guided some of their decisions and beliefs. But then there were other economic factors that maybe made them lean democratic. Um, I think for some people, the evangelical way of faith um, is kind of all-encompassing. And, you know, so, th so there's uh, political views being preached from the pulpit in a way that maybe is new and maybe and you know more uh, preachers uh, with political opinions. Okay, um, Professor Harris, um, who's looming above me, um, could you talk a little bit about kind of your contact still with people around Biden and what you think is the the mood or what are people talking about on the uh, still to be launched Biden campaign and um, and and their political mood as as uh, as we move closer to the election. That's a huge question. Um, the discussion is um, very broad, but also very, very targeted. You know, the electorate 
can be divided into obviously states, but also populations. Um, and so the uh, both parties are focusing on particular populations of voters um, that they think are either persuadable or need to be solidified leading into the same three months leading up to basically the period after the conventions, which is going to be the critical, the critical period. Um, the uh, one of the communities that the the, uh, the Biden campaign is very focused on is uh, Latinos, particularly younger Latinos. Um, there there are populations of, of Latino voters where there's not a lot of vote for for growing uh, President Biden's support. But there are populations where there's just a very large undecided population. Also, younger African American voters have drifted away from the Democratic Party slightly, which means that they are now not at 80, 85, 90% support. They're more than 70, 75%, maybe 65% support, depending upon the state population. Um, women are uh, particularly. Um, um, Single women who did not go to college, women who went to college, are going to be a very tight focus because they, are, first of all, they're more likely to be responsive to a message relating to the Supreme Court's decision uh, about reproductive rights or the lack thereof. Um, but also uh, suburban women and single non-college women, meaning single women who didn't go to college, are, uh, you know, swing voters is not the right word they are voters who are gettable for President Biden. But all of this is in the context of a very small number of states that are going to decide how this election comes out. Uh, you know, you can rattle off, I, I would say there's six, maybe seven, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Wisconsin, Michigan, Arizona, and some people think Nevada. I'm, I'm a little less convinced about Nevada, but you know, with Latino voters, more in play, I think, Nevada as a possibility. Uh, and, you know, some of those states are, are going to be very much more difficult for President Biden. Some of those states, I think, will be easier uh, for President Biden. One of the big changes that's happened since 2000 is that several of those states now ha that had Republican governors now have Democratic governors. Pennsylvania, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Arizona have Democratic governors now. Um, and the, the political environment in Georgia is just a mess for the Republican Party right now. So it's a, 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 I would say that there's both a, both a broadcasting task, but also there's a narrow casting task based on states and also on populations. And all of this, by the way, while trying to run the country, which is more than a little bit challenging. And the president doesn't really control some of what's happening in the environment around him. For example, the UAW strike, which I've spent a lot of time talking about in the last three, four weeks uh, with uh, your friends in the media and Jill's friends in the media. Um, the president, you couldn't have predicted it. We didn't know it was going to happen until the last couple of months. And, you know, it's, it's just a complication. It's particularly a complication in a couple of the states that I just mentioned. So um, it'll be interesting. You know, the most important thing I think to say is the election is 13 and a half months away. A day in politics is like a year, and 13 and a half months is an eternity. We don't know what the election is going to look like in November of 2024, although I would say that the polling has been amazingly static for an extended period of time. It is a very close race. Some people think two points either way. You know, President Trump's support has not really been eroding given everything that's been happening. President Biden's support has not been improving, even given the improvement in the economy and the decline in inflation. So, um, it, it, it's, uh, there's a lot more to have, there's a lot more we need to see happen and the campaign needs to see happen and has to make happen before we'll know where we're heading in the election. Um, Seth, let me just quickly follow up with something that came up last week a lot and came up just now in the seminar portion of our class, which is Biden's age. Um, you know, John Harwood was here, um, formerly of CNN, the New York Times, and you know, last week he basically said, yes, Biden is old, he's gonna continue to be old, and you know, the election should be about other things. But you know, I think it's hard, even just in throwing it open, how often students especially, but 
Other Democrats clearly are concerned about that. What's your sense of the importance of that? And how do you think Biden will or should respond to that? Uh, well, so my personal view of the fact that he's, he's old, <laughs> you know, there's, uh, although, you know, let me just say, being 80 now is very different than being 80 when my grandfather was 80. Um, but, um, so he is old for most Americans. And it is an issue that looms large with a large number of Americans. In fact, if you ask voters, and a lot of pollsters are doing this, both privately and publicly, um, what, is, what are you most concerned about with respect to President Biden? It's not inflation, it's not Ukraine, it's not that he's a socialist, it's not any of that stuff. It's his age and his mental capacity affected by his age. Um, and, you know, that's kind of, that's one of those things that's very hard to unprove, right? I mean, he's not going to all of a sudden be, become young. He's not going to all of a sudden present young. But there's also a lot of evidence that when voters see him engaging with people, see him in crowds, talking to people, doing his sort of quintessential Joe Biden hand on the shoulder, maybe a little more than that, sometimes grabbing somebody by the arm, um, you know, they, that makes them feel better. And when they see him give a speech, when they see him sparring with the press, and certainly when they saw him at the State of the Union, when he had that back and forth with the Republicans who were heckling him, they did him a huge favor because he, I think, was widely viewed to have won that back and forth. And frankly, he had the microphone, so there was no question that he was going to win. But uh, that helps him. Those kinds of interactions help him. So I think you will see him on the campaign trail doing a, a lot of town halls, a lot of in-person meetings, group meetings, things that show him being active. So you can't change the fact that he's old, but you can make the point that he's being old. It doesn't mean that he's mentally deficient and unable to do the job. The other thing that the campaign will talk about is that Donald Trump is three years younger than Joe Biden. And even when he was president, people were talking about the fact that President Trump displayed some effects of age, like all of us who age do. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see sort of how that plays off as well. But absolutely right, it's a big issue. It is a looming issue for a lot of voters. But, you know, that's when they're judging him in a vacuum, not when they're judging him against President Trump. It will be, uh, the contrast will be what the Democrats will try to focus on as much as possible in a number of ways. Great, thank you, Seth. Um, Professor Abramson, let me just uh, ask you, um, from kind of work. Can, can, can I just jump in? Because I, I sort of disagree with Seth on a, a couple of things. The floor is uh, yours. Is that okay if I, Absolutely. I don't linger on that? But uh, I think the, the age problem for Biden is that his, his signs of aging, especially like watching him walking in a very ginger, you know, manner, sort of shuffling, and his problems, the problems with his voice from time to time, that that equates in voters' minds weakness. And Donald Trump, you know, is no spring chicken in terms of his actual age, but he still comes across very forcefully and despise what he has to say, um, as many people do, he seems quite forceful. I don't think being viewed as weak physically or in his capacities is a problem for Trump. Uh, and I think just Biden, it's a terrible loop. It's Concerned about his age, which seems to indicate weakness, and then you know tied in with just the number of the numbers in the polls of people who just do not want him to run. It, it remains staggeringly large, and uh, I don't know. Maybe you're right that by being out with people and showing bigger on the campaign trail will help. But, but I think it's a really tough problem. Jill, how would you evaluate, I mean, if you were kind of setting the agenda, what you think the media should be focusing on and what do you worry could go wrong? 
Well, you know, it, it'd be, I think, interesting to start with Biden's age. Uh, I, I find fault with, you know, there's a lot of um, the newspaper articles, most, most recently over the weekend in the Washington Post, there was kind of the umpteenth article about Democrats, you know, being very nervous about Biden and, you know, having problems with him as the, the nominee. Uh, there was only one named Democrat in the piece. Everything else was sort of an anonymous donor or, you know, county Democratic chairman or member of Congress. And, you know, I, I don't think that those pieces, pieces just repeating that over and over and over again contribute much to sort of the political knowledge of the country and it doesn't fulfill, you know, our mission in the press of providing valuable information that people can use in their lives and which become, you know, it make them informed voters. So I thought that. Uh, I still think, you know, and, and that the, the coverage even, you know, Seth emphasized how far out we are from election day, which I think is a critical point. But, you know, the number of polls that we're bombarded with, uh, certainly on a weekly basis, if not a daily basis, and the press's obsession with polls, which are only a snapshot of right now, I think, you know, it, it, it's too much and it feeds into um, a way of covering politics as a game almost, as a competitive sports game of who's up, who's down, and very little substance about why someone is either rising or falling. Uh, based on real reporting on the ground, uh, so so that that worries me. Uh, you know, there, there are so many wild cards in the the coverage right now. You have on the Biden side of the ledger, you know, the now indictment of Hunter Biden and the continuing. Uh, investigation of his business activities because his plea deal fell apart. And, you know, so far, again, as of now, it doesn't look like that issue is really hurting by them, but we don't know what more may come out, et cetera, et cetera. That's sort of a wild card. And, you know, on the Trump side, you know, it looks like his base is, is true true to him no matter what. And, you know, he's now got, you know, many indictments and, you know, the possibility still that there could be a trial uh, sometime in, in 2024. And, you know, whether that begins to bite and have an effect on um, his poll numbers, we'll just have to see. You know, it doesn't look right now like there's going to be a Georgia trial anytime soon, uh, which two weeks ago it looked like there would be. But, you know, I, I would say even though we haven't seen a big impact in the polls, that Trump's legal problems are, you know, his equivalent wild card. Okay, great. Um, Bella, let me ask you, we talked, I mean, I think the Biden age issue is kind of one end of this discussion and uh, younger voters and their views is kind of the other. And one of the things that's come through in the polling and I think also uh, in class has been kind of a disillusionment among younger voters with the Democratic Party, but also maybe with politics in general. Uh, and I'm wondering what your research has found in terms of how younger people are organizing or not organizing, what motivates them, and what the future looks like. You know, will there be 
groups that will come along to match, say, the um, you know the Federalist Society or the um, uh, uh, you know the anti the uh, pro-choice groups that have become a real factor, Black Lives Matter and so forth, is is something on the horizon for younger voters that way. Um, but the thing is with young voters, half of them are cynical and half of them are not. That's really hard data that I've got there. But I think I, for my part, for, my, for myself, I'm a cynical person. And so I would never really go in for, you know, Biden is going to really do it this time. Maybe we wanted Bernie, but it's all going to be just fine. I think there is a large proportion of people our age and of every age that are disillusioned and have been increasingly so for the past maybe since 2016 or longer. And what's interesting is that there is still a large proportion of young people who don't feel that way or maybe have mixed feelings and are still willing to, you know, go out on a limb and protest. I was at the Sunrise Movement meeting just last week, uh, which is a climate movement, and I had talked to people about it and they said, oh, you know, that thing, like it's so, they're just doing it for their resumes, you know, it's not, and this is people our age speaking, or, you know, 18, 19, 20, they're just doing it to look good. They're just holding some signs and all this different kind of stuff. And then I went to the meeting and these people have been organizing since they were, you know, 17, younger, any kind of sort of thing. So I think there is definitely a split, uh, between the kinds of people that do that and the kinds of people that don't, um, and yeah. Could you talk a little bit, because you've also looked at Students for Life, which I think is interesting, especially in a Northeastern bubble, people are probably more familiar with the reproductive rights organizations uh, than with Students for Life. What's your sense of their organizational capacity compared to, say, progressive groups? Um, what's, what's that side of the coin like? Um, there's definitely less pro-life students than there are pro-choice ones. Uh, you know, we're not supposed to have political opinions or anything as journalists, but I, for one, am happy that that's the case. I think um, I was at this Students for Life rally in D.C. over the summer in June 24th, I want to say, uh, celebrating the anniversary of Dobbs. And I just got the sense that a lot of the more Republican young activists or just conservative in general, um, they're maybe being used as all student activists are sometimes used by, you know, the super PACs or like larger political interests because it always looks good when young people are on your side. Um, I mean, yeah, so definitely smaller base on that side, but they, they are genuine. It's not as if they're like, you know, crisis actors getting paid to say or to volunteer at these pro-life organizations. They are genuine, but there's definitely less of them than there are of pro-choice students. Professor VR, you wanted to talk about this? Yeah, I wanted to share, um, you know, thinking about youth when in for the 2020 election, I was part of some um, focus groups and kind of community insight seeking about um, young Latino voters and particularly Puerto Rican voters. And there is a big distinction between Puerto Ricans and other Latino folks in that Puerto Ricans are born with a US passport. So immigration and documentation status is not as big of a thing. There's solidarity, but it's not something we go through personally. <laughs> but um, the so obviously for for some people, immigration, how immigrants are treated is a really important topic, right? Um, but one recurring theme that was very surprising was that for Latino voters in 2020, uh, too many of them said uh, they didn't see much difference between Trump and Biden, right? It's still an old white guy that represents corporations that doesn't does nothing to address me, right? With no, you know, so the things that concern Latinos and, you know, probably most poor people, right? Housing costs, exorbitant housing costs, uh, you know, difficulty 
to get healthy food, health care access, and that, you know, even if you're insured, you can't really get all the services that you need because you, you, you can't afford the extra costs. Um, those weren't really being addressed much, so it became more of a social thing than their current day-to-day -day concerns, and that the, the, real, the conclusion was that it didn't really matter too much in their daily lives. This is especially among young voters? Yes, young his Latino voters was, was the group we were talking to. Who are the um, role models they look up to? In politics or in general? To you, are you to thinking about like for strategic communication, who would be the right spokespeople? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they're lacking, right? Because so one of the things is that the messages about Biden and about Trump are getting, especially to the Spanish-speaking Latino communities, uh, trans, you know, kind of interpreted through radio talk show hosts and, you know, and, and just talk show hosts on TV and, and things like that. So who... Spanish language. In Spanish media. language media. So who are their role models? You know, often there's generational... Pol political differences between parents and children, right? Because they've had different life experiences and things like that. So I think that's a that's an important question, right? I mean, you have to in different communities, it's going to be different people. Um, let me ask you uh, sort of further on that. One of the things that came up in class uh, earlier was this question of disinformation, conspiracy theories in Spanish language media. I think there is a sense that you know, on the English language side you know, newspapers, TV stations are aware of it and trying to at least fact check or, or get other points of view out there. What's going on? I know you've done some work on this, on Spanish language media. Yeah, we did a project um, around the 22 m midterms. Um, and, you know, with the expectation, because this is exactly what, you know, there is not a lot of monitoring, like the Spanish language media can get away with things sometimes that English language media wouldn't because there aren't the monitors there for, you know, mild profanity and things like that, right? But, um, you know, there is the expectation that these, you know, crazy conspiracy theories and maybe exaggerations were going on. And what we found was that, um, you know, there's... It, it, it's really, this is my, my conclusion. So yes, there are, there's agendas being pushed depending on the political views of the, of the hosts on the radio, right? But what counts as a lie or a fabrication is a very kind of gray area, right? Because if you're giving your opinion about something or if you're reporting that Marco Rubio gave an opinion about something, <laughs> right? Then it's not, it's, not a, it's not misinformation that Marco Rubio had an opinion, but then that opinion is shared and shared and then it, 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 it's lost that it was an opinion. And then it becomes something that just keeps getting repeated. Right, and I think it's a general problem of the distinction between this twenty-four hour cycle, media cycle. That sometimes there's there's a loss of the distinction between what's reporting news and what's people just going on about their views. And um, so, you know, the conclusion wasn't that that there was outright lies or things that were not backed up but rather that things were framed in a certain way and then repeated and repeated. Um, Seth, uh, let me ask you, you know, uh, up, up until a few years ago, I think, um, all the talk in political media circles was about working class white men, right? That men without college degrees, this was a, a part of the country Trump uh, had done very well in, the Democrats had lost um, influence with them. <clears throat> that kind of morphed into the you know, a bunch of other debates. Um, what's your sense now about white working class men as one of those voter groups that are being divvied up, but also more broadly, labor issues are suddenly really important, it seems. And, and how you think that's gonna play out and which party might benefit from that? Uh, gee, every question you ask me gets bigger, not smaller, Jonathan, for goodness sakes. Uh, I'll be asking about the Patriots, but we'll save that for the end. You're going to be asking me to, to give a definition of religion or something like that. Um, 
So let's start with, with white, uh, uh, white working class men is a complicated concept. Let's talk about white men who have not gone to college because there's a, one of the interesting things that's happening in labor right now is that you have a sizable number of college graduates who are underemployed, meaning they are doing jobs that don't require a college degree. And many of them are playing a leadership role in a lot of the activism that we're seeing. In fact, if you look at the leaders of the organizing effort at Starbucks, some of the organizers at Amazon, some of the organizers at Apple, some of the organizers at Trader Joe's, not, not professional union organizers, but worker organizers who are working in those facilities and organizing. So I'd rather think about the political question as being white men who have not gone to college. And so there are two, I think we have to agree, dissonant facts. One is that the overwhelming majority of President Biden's economic agenda is aimed at helping that population of folks, not just white, work, white non-college men, but non-college Americans, non-college workers generally, to get good quality middle class jobs. Big investments in manufacturing, big investments in the energy industry, big investments in infrastructure. Those are all jobs that one can do without a college degree. Many of them require apprenticeships or other kinds of training, but you don't have to have either an associate's or a bachelor's in order to be able to do that. So, in large part, the overwhelming beneficiaries of the economic agenda, it helps the country as a whole, no question about it, but the direct beneficiaries are going to be a lot of those voters who, as you accurately said, have had trouble with, have had trouble with the Democratic Party dating arguably all the way back to the late 1970s, and certainly the Reagan election, which you're, I'm sure, writing about brilliantly in your book, uh, in 1980. Um, there were so-called Reagan Democrats then. There are folks we talk about now who were Obama-Trump voters. There are Obama-Trump-Biden voters. It's, it's a complicated group of folks. Um, so the task for the Democratic Party and for President Biden is not to try to win that. It's going to be very difficult to win that group of folks for a whole bunch of cultural reasons, for a whole bunch of economic reasons also because of where they happen to be economically, uh, 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 geographically located. Um, it becomes very difficult to get them because they're in, many of them are in red states, they're disproportionately in red and so we might argue are pink states. Um, but it's to narrow the gap as much as possible. And one of the intriguing things that happened is that many of the unions, not all, but many of the unions that represent those kinds of workers had endorsed President Biden for president in 2020 very, very, very late in the process. I just did an interview on the Power at Work blog with the president of the Laborers International Union, which is a, among other things, a building trades union. And in 2020, the laborers, in, and by the way, that interview will be available beginning on Monday on the Power at Work blog, so it's worth watching. Um, the, that union uh, endorsed President Biden in September of 2020, two months before the election, less than two months before the election. This time, they endorsed him this past June, 17 months before the election. And most of the building trades unions, almost all, not the teachers, but most of the others, um, and a total of about 20 unions plus the AFL-CIO, have already endorsed, and that is because they know there are a lot of members who support Donald Trump, and they want to be able to early on, this is what the President of the Labor is me, early on in the process, they want to start selling to those members, explaining why President Biden's agenda was designed to help them. Now, will that turn things around? No. Union voters generally vote for Democrats at about a 5%, 10%, higher rate than other voters like that who are non-union, but if they can grow that number, grow that gap, they get more of those voters aiming towards President Biden, particularly in those six or seven swing states that I talked about, which many of which are heavily unionized, um, there is a possibility of sort of narrowing that gap. Um, <clears throat> Jill, you've written a book um, that we're reading now in class um, about changes in the media, how things are changing. And, and I wonder, you know, Seth, in a way, has been talking about this micro-targeting that's going on in politics, going after certain groups, 
whether by race, by ethnicity, by educational status, and so forth. And I'm, I'm wondering if you feel the same thing is happening in media and what that means for kind of democracy more broadly. I mean, I think many of us remember a time where the idea was you had three networks and three newspapers, and while they had their right. failings, we were all in kind of... We, we talked about that last week, about uh, how, you know, in certainly the, the 60s, well into the, the, the 1970s, uh, most people got their news uh, from television, and mainly from uh, the major networks. Fox, Fox News didn't even come along until 1996. Uh, so it was CBS, NBC, ABC, you know, to some degree, CNN. But um, now, you know, the, the news media landscape has become so atomized. Uh, and algorithms uh, work in a way, uh, for instance, you know, Bella was talking about young voters, and young voters get a lot of their news from social media, and the algorithms that are used uh, to disperse and deliver news are such that yeah, they want, they know exactly what you're clicking on, and so they know generally, you know, what you like and what your politics are through what you're clicking on, and they feed you more and more of, you know, political news that takes a very similar point of view and vantage point as you do uh, through your consuming habits. and. You know, I think that that, that that has had an ill effect on democracy because it means that people generally are not getting reliable quality information and true, uh, true stories, factual journalism, from you know the kinds of reputable sources that had mass audiences back in the 60s and 70s. So, you know, I, I, I think that that has uh, tended to drive partisanship. Uh, and, and there are several surveys and polls that, that show a correlation between the two. Uh, I, you know, in terms of, can, can I just address a little bit of, of sure. what Seth was talking about, which I found so fascinating, which is, you know, in terms of the media, uh, there's a, a fascinating article that just popped into my uh, inbox this morning in the Atlantic, uh, written by a young woman journalist who you know, it is quite liberal, but it's kind of a, a cry of uh, self-blaming about she feels that too much attention by liberals over the past about 20 years has been focused on identity issues and, and social issues, and that it's almost like while liberals were sleeping, you know, the other side, Republican conservatives, have been so focused on strengthening corporate power. I mean, basically getting rid of the whole regulatory framework that the government, uh, you know, was was had had structured earlier that that. Sweeping away regulation, uh, you know, pouring dark money into all kinds of political uh, organizations. Jonathan mentioned the Federalist Society, and that would certainly be one. But that really, you know, their number one thing is, you know, the unfettered business and unfettered capitalism. And that, you know, the, the argument that she frames is almost saying, that Democrats and liberals 
we're only too distracted by these other issues to fight back against that. And you know, it was kind of interesting now. I mean, I may be wrong, but from what I'm reading in the press, it seems like unions are on an upswing right now. And you know, maybe that could shift the political focus, you know, of, of Democrats and more liberal voters back to core economic issues, you know, the wealth gap, et cetera, et cetera. And and it, it, it's a really good good piece. And if any of the the students certainly have access to the Atlantic, I think it just was published today. It it it, it, it really interested me. Um, Bella, what's your if you can maybe talk about that a little bit, both from your own experience but the people you've been interviewing do you see that the kind of focus on identity issues, things like that, is that still what's motivating people? Or is there, because of abortion, climate change, the issues are, are coming more to the fore? Um, motivating people in terms of political involvement? Um, I think just from the very limited sample size of my friends, um, I think definitely abortion has been a major issue. I think it's been a very similar sort of pattern since I don't think any of my immediate, you know, circle of people are individually identified as activists. So as I may have mentioned, you know, maybe in high school they would have marched for Parkland and the March for Our Lives, uh, maybe the Women's March, things like that. So I think in that sense it's sort of slightly receded, if only because um, I think the focus on identities, the positive part of that at least in terms of you know racial justice hey, hey, Bella, yeah can I, can I just interject something sure it's almost from the, the great report thing you've done it's almost as if some of the core issues that you know youth propelled groups uh are organized around have almost become identity issues like for the, the young people involved in the, the Sunrise Movement, uh, you know, pushing the Green New Deal and other environmental causes. It's like their identity becomes that they're, you know, environmentalists fighting climate change. And, you know, it, it, it almost reminds me of, you know, other, other ways that uh, people uh, use identity in politics, uh, and you know, I, I hadn't until Bella, you know, has shared with me her rounds of reporting. You know, that that thought hadn't occurred to me, but it certainly has now. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think just to finish like that part, just I, I will forget about it if I don't finish it. But I think that maybe there's slightly less of a focus, if only because it's being heard now in a way that it wasn't before. You know, I think if a few years ago, um, you know, there'll be more of a discussion about that, but there's been more comfort in having that dialogue in terms of like, I think an issue within the Sunrise Movement that there was before. Um, I'm not sure to what extent that's still a problem like today, but there was some reporting, I think from Buzzfeed News that some activists of color didn't feel heard in the movement and they had those complaints with national organization and things like that. Um, I think another part of that is that these bursts of attention kind of naturally die down. That doesn't mean that they're not still salient issues. Like for example, we're not marching for gun control like tomorrow in that I know of, but it's still obviously a massive problem. But for whatever reason, you know, after the Evalde shooting, we didn't have that exact same March for Our Lives moment as we did then. So I think it's part what young people and young activists, which isn't always the same sort of personality, uh, care about. And it's also what the media cycle will care about. Um, and yeah. Have you seen uh, the activism and the demonstrations uh, translate into voting? Um, or uh, other types of uh, policy actions that uh, then have affected legislation or the way a city council operates or 
the way a school committee operates, whatever. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm not sure if how much that goes for national voting, especially, if, I mean, at least for 2024. I mean, Biden can humor climate activists, for example, all he wants, but he knows they'll still vote for him because they'll hardly go and vote for Trump. Uh, but something I have noticed is that uh, movements like just like the mutual aid approach and a more community focused approach has definitely emerged. Um, there was a Sunrise Hub in Silver Spring, which is like a suburb or town in Maryland just outside of DC, where they were actively uh, organizing and pushing for uh, like a more leftist rent control bill, like something like a 3% cap rather than a 6%. And they were just really dogged about it and really invested in kind of aligning with other community organizations to get that done. And I thought that was really interesting. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to you folks in the audience to ask questions. But uh, while you're thinking about it, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Maria Elena a question, which is that, you know, we often try in these forums to talk a bit about solutions. Where could things get better? And so if, you know, Biden summoned you to the White House and said, how do I connect with younger voters? Like, what should I be doing? Um, you know, Seth talked about the vigorous Nakarala campaign trail, but from a, a, a kind of policy point of view or a messaging point of view, what do you think the Democrats need to do to sort of stop this either erosion of support or erosion of enthusiasm? Yeah, that, that's an interesting question because, of course, depending on the area, there's different concerns. And that's one of the things, you know, when I hear um, these kind of national results of polls, right, of like these group of people think this way, this group of people think that way, you know, as a strategic communicator, I'm like, well, but, you know, within there, there's segments and things like that, right? So, um, I mean... This is true, I think, of, of Latino youth, but of all youth is like thinking of the future and ability to buy homes and ability to pay off debt and or to, you know, to have a future that represents somewhat of what was promised, right, as the American, <laughs> as what, what happens when you came here, right? Um, the... So I think the, the economics and the livelihood and the future is... A, is is a focus that's really important. You know, the cancellation of student debt would be, you know, is one of those important ones, but perhaps not as much, you know, perhaps in the Hispanic community, especially new voters, right? That's not something that they carried with them. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the, the issues of, of Latino youth are the same as all youth, right? It's their, it's their future and their ability to be self-sufficient. Um, but more than anything, I think it's a lack of cultural connection and just uh, connection. So the age doesn't help at all. But also, um, you know, and this is probably true for all non-white <laughs> groups, right? They just don't feel very much that they are a target audience at all for at the federal level. Um, Seth, what about you? What would you advise Biden to do kind of beyond you know, the issues he's trying to address? Economically, are there things you can do to kind of activate younger voters? I'm sorry, Josh, was that for me? Yes. Okay. Uh, so I think that this will be this may be an unpopular answer, but um, I'll, I'll give I'll give sort of two answers that will be equally unpopular. How about that? So I can really uh, uh, lose all my friends in the room. The, the first thing is that uh, on election day, there are essentially going to be three choices for voters. They can vote for Joe Biden, they can vote for Donald, let me just say, it's, it's becoming increasingly apparent that Donald Trump is going to be the nominee of the Republican Party, so I'm just going to assume that for the purposes of this. The three options are vote for Joe Biden, vote for Donald Trump, or stay at home. It is possible, but not likely, that Dr. Cornell West will run as a Green Party candidate. There may be a Green Party candidate, even if it's not Dr. West. But they're unlikely to glean a meaningful number of votes. There's a group called No Labels that purports to be a moderate group for which there is zero support. And the rationale for, it, for a candidacy on a No Labels line 
it was utterly lacking among voters. They just, they're not going to make a meaningful difference. There's zero chance they can win. So really, the three choices are Donald Trump, Joe Biden, and not voting. Um, and so voters will be put to that choice. And so you, you mentioned earlier that there are, or Jill mentioned, two-thirds of voters wish they had another choice other than Joe Biden on the Democratic Party line. They're not going to have another choice. He's going to be the only choice. And they can choose... Joe Biden, or they can choose Donald Trump, or they can stay at home. Those are the choices. And they're going to have to choose one of them. Second, um, uh, it is not possible to overstate the importance of a Supreme Court decision in Dobbs and its effect on American politics. It was uh, you know, an earthquake coupled with a typhoon and a tsunami in American politics. And it has had a definitive effect on elections ever since it was decided, and will have an extraordinarily important elect uh, effect on the 2024 election. And hey, Sam, yes, you should point out that the Democrats have, you know, swept most of the you know, state elections. They and look by like local elections. Right, absolutely. And let me, and, and let me add. I'll give you two pieces of evidence uh, in support of this. One is that there was a Supreme Court election in Wisconsin, and you know, for judges who run for office, you're not supposed to say what you're going to do if you're there. And the candidate, who, it's also supposed to, I believe it's supposed to be nonpartisan, or perhaps it's partisan, the obviously Democratic Party candidate said, I'm for abortion rights, and won, and in Wisconsin, in presidential elections, if there's a whisker of an eyelash of a distance between the two parties, and that candidate won by, I think, eight points. Sarah, yeah. what is for Wisconsin a huge number? Second thing, second piece Do you of remember how much money was spent on that I'm, race? It I'm was, guessing it was north of 30 million for the Was this, a yeah, huge what do you think for a local court race? Right. And let me, let me, and here's the second piece of evidence for my point about how gigantic Dobbs is, and particularly with respect to younger voters, because you asked me about younger voters. Donald Trump, who uh, celebrated the end of Roe versus Wade and appointed the three judges who made the end of Roe versus Wade possible, and condemned the evangelical community because they were not being grateful enough to him for having ended Roe versus Wade, is now hedging on abortion rights. He will not say if he would sign a national abortion ban, he would not say if he would sign a law like the law that said Governor DeSantis signed in Florida, which is a six week, uh, we a ban after six weeks of gestation uh, on abortion. Um, he is utterly trying to fudge the issue because he knows it is going to be disastrous for him among younger voters and among women voters, particularly suburban women voters. Women who went to college, non-college, it is really a disaster. And let me also say, the men who love them. So, it, and let me also say, men, not just because they love women who might need or want an abortion or think that their bodies are their own, God forbid, but also because that could be the first domino in a series of really disastrous decisions by the Supreme Court appointed by Donald Trump that will deprive millions and millions and millions and millions of Americans of their liberties. And so he's, he's sort of trying to wash his hands of it. And, and that's a sign of how potent the issue is. So those two things together, and I, I'm, being a little, I'm being very real politic, John thinks, and I know you and Joe can take it, and I know your students can as well. Um, it's those two facts are going to come together on election day. And Folks who don't love Joe Biden and wish Joe Biden were 20 years younger, including Joe Biden, by the way, are going to go in and vote for Joe Biden because that's the choice that is presented to them. Now, younger voters are more likely than other voters, older voters, to stay home in a situation where they don't like their two choices, but they didn't do that in 2022, and they did not do that in 2020, and President Biden won the group of voters who said, I don't like either of them, and he won that group by a substantial margin. And that's one of the big questions in this election is, will he win that group by a substantial margin again?
So I now lost every friend in the room that I ever had, but I hope that was illuminating nonetheless. Uh, Professor VR, you wanted to add something? Well, it was related to the, to the last group that's going to stay home, right? Because um, you're assuming that people will vote against Trump, but if there's apathy and indifference and you don't feel addressed by the Democrats, then kind of sitting on the laurels because it's the only choice, um, I think, could, could result in a lot of people staying home or voting third party, which could also be complicated. Um, okay, let's open it up to questions. Do um, uh, you need my mic? Okay. Wait till the mic gets to you. Um, any questions? Anybody want to open it up? Yeah. Um, it's come up now here in the open classroom and back when we were in the smaller classroom. Um, kind of just like, oh, it comes down to only having Biden or Trump, only having this or that. Um, and my question to you are, or is, I guess it's a two-part question. First of all, what would you suggest we do in regards to the kind of stalemate that it comes from having just a two-party system? On top of that, how do you feel like the issue with the Electoral College kind of plays into our entire issue with like electing a president? Because that on its own is like an entire 10-hour conversation plus, you know? So. Yeah. Um. There, there is no doubt that the Electoral College gives um, Trump, or if he's not the nominee, the Republican nominee, an advantage. Uh, that's just built in. Uh, the, the red states that have relatively low populations, you know, have considerable electoral votes and uh you know it it, it, it makes it so you know i, I think it, it's the electoral college is undemocratic because it almost makes voting in places like new york and california and increasingly even texas which leans you know now heavily Republican. It, 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 it almost makes your going to vote not count because of the way the Electoral College works. And, uh, you know, I think it's been a serious problem in the country that we've had two presidents, uh, you know, since 2000 who lost the, the popular vote. Uh, you know, that, I think that is a, a fundamental problem of our political system now. And unfortunately, looking to a solution, I don't think realistically that the Electoral College will be abolished or recalibrated, at least not in my lifetime. And what about <clears throat> the two-party? You know, that's our choice idea. Uh, so, I mean, Seth, you said that the no labels thing is like a non-starter. Uh, Bernie Sanders maybe flirted at one point with a third party. Uh, Cornell West is going to try maybe for a third party. Do you see any way in which we move beyond the kind of binary choice that we're facing everywhere at every level? I'm sorry, I'm having a little bit of trouble hearing the folks in the room. So and if, if the question is, is there, do I foresee any time when we will have a choice other than this two-party choice? Yes. I think the answer to that is no. Um, I, they, you know, there has not been a successful third party run for office since the collapse, I believe this is correct. Yeah, yeah. There are people in the room who are probably better historians, almost certainly better historians than I am. Since the collapse of the Whig Party, just prior to the Civil War, um, the two-party system is very, very, very heavily entrenched in our system. And we can, I'm not arguing that that's a good thing or that we should try to sustain it. It's just the truth. I agree with Jill. The Electoral College is, is an offense to democracy. But I don't foresee a, a time when we're going to get rid of the Electoral College either, 
because there are too many states that benefit from it that would have to vote to get rid of it because you'd have to amend the Constitution. So I think you know we have to deal with the reality that's in front of us. Uh, the answer to the earlier question about what should you do if you're unhappy and frustrated with um, with the current set of choices is engage, engage, participate, fight for a different candidate. Um, I would hope you don't fight for a third party candidate this time because I, I think I know who that will benefit, but. You know, there are lots of candidates from across the spectrum in, a, in both parties. You know, the spectrum in, in one party might be narrower than the other, but, but there's a pretty broad, broad spectrum in both parties um, built around coalitions of voters. And if you can build a coalition around a party, around a candidate who you support, then there's the possibility of that candidate succeeding. You know, the leading Democratic candidate in 2020, coming out of the first two primaries, was Bernie Sanders. And it was not out of the question that Bernie Sanders could have been the nominee of the Democratic Party. And it's not because he made a mistake, it's just there was an electoral miscalculation in the way they approached certain communities that are fundamental to the Democratic Party. Um, they just, they just didn't, they didn't make the inroads that they needed to make in certain communities, and as a result, it didn't, it didn't turn out for him. Um, and also, there's a sizable population of folks in the Democratic Party that just don't want Bernie Sanders to be their nominee and, and are aggressively going to pursue an alternative to that. But that should suggest to you that it is possible to organize on behalf of a candidate who young voters very enthusiastically like, who by the way is older than President Biden, um, and potentially win. Now, the problem is you don't always win. Some percentage of the time you're going to lose, but there are a lot party that everybody can like and support. Different groups of people, not everybody can like, but different groups of people can like and support. So for people who support Bernie Sanders, there's uh, Ocasio Cortez out of New York, and Ro Khanna out of California, and others in Congress, in the Senate, John Fetterman, Tyler Brown in, uh, in uh, Ohio, who's up for re-election this time who are voices not exactly like Bernie Sanders, but similar, related, you can influence policy in that way. Those people have an immense amount of influence on policy. Bernie Sanders has an immense amount of influence on policy in the White House. I felt that fairly intensely. So my answer is get in the game. Get in the game. Not going to the polls is not an answer to the problem I don't like the choices. The answer is get yourself better choices. Fight hard for better choices. And you're up against huge, powerful interests that are going to try and keep you from succeeding. But, you know, democracy means more people beats more money. Should mean that. I mean, you know, it, 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 there is a, 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 a possibility that there would be a very strong, independent presidential candidate, neither, you know, running as a Republican or a Democrat. And, you know, back. I know it sounds like ancient history to you, but it, it, it seems recent to me. In 1992, um, the reason I think that Bill Clinton was elected, he didn't have you know anything close to a majority of the vote, was because a, a business, back, you know, a, a very prominent businessman named Ross Perot ran as an independent. Uh, and he drew away, he got enough votes that, um, and drew more votes away from the incumbent president, George, uh, George H.W. Bush, that, that Clinton, Clinton was elected. Uh, and that's why that election was also a good example of generational change after, you know, Reagan, you know, was was an old candidate and you know he had towards the end of the second term began to exhibit signs of Alzheimer's disease which he ultimately went public that he had it after he left office and uh, you had Clinton and Gore who were then young uh, elected and you know, I, I watch carefully, uh, you know, the Senate race in West Virginia because Joe Manchin, who's the incumbent Democratic senator, 
you know, has been an unsteady ally, um, if not worse than that, to his party, and you know, certainly completely opposed the Biden agenda on the, the environment because West Virginia is coal country. But he's thinking very seriously of, of running as, a, as an independent, evidently. And should he not do that and be reelected, the likelihood of him switching parties and becoming a Republican, I think, is pretty high because he, he, he said he's considering that. But that, that's, I think, a state where there's going to be an uh, a interesting test of party strength. In a, in a state that used to be Democratic and hasn't, but hasn't gone for the Democratic presidential candidate, I think, since the, the 90s. Uh, another question? The question is, what about the possibility of Trump being disqualified? There's some people who argue, is it the 13th yeah. Amendment? 14th Amendment can be used to disqualify someone who's either under indictment or, um, or, or convicted. Um, yeah, it, it's a provision of, of the 14th Amendment that, um, you know, they, there, there's respectable legal opinion uh, a professor at Harvard Law School, uh, Larry Tri, is it was one of the first uh, legal thinkers to publicize the possibility of being able to use, you know, a, a 14th Amendment provision to disqualify Trump. Uh, I I don't think that that has enough legs to really catch on. I think it's unlikely that there will be, you know, a challenge that's credible to hit to Trump's viability as a candidate based on that legal reasoning. But I think it's interesting. Uh, you know, I can see the logic behind it and, you know, that Trump, because basically he committed treason, you know, could be disqualified without having been found guilty. But I, I, again, I just don't see it as a practical possibility. Yeah, I just I want to agree on and say that uh, it, it's an interesting legal argument. Uh, the provision of the 14th Amendment disqualifies people who have engaged in insurrection against the United States or supported insurrection against the United States. And the language, the text of the Constitution doesn't require that you have been convicted for insurrection. It merely requires that you have engaged in it. The problem is, and this is true in many of the circumstances surrounding President Trump, is that provision has never been used in a circumstance like this. The last time it was used was uh, to apply to former uh, Confederates who literally seceded from the United States and fought a war against the United States government. They were excluded from federal office. Um, there's an argument that the president is not an official of the United States government. I don't really love that argument. That's a sort of, that's too lawyerly even for me as a law lawyer and law professor. Um, but I don't think the election is going to be decided by that kind of a legal argument. It's too, it, it would be too undemocratic to take away from people the opportunity to vote for a candidate who's the leading candidate by a lot of one of the two major parties in the United States. Um, it's, it, it's too attenuated. And the idea that state secretaries of state will make that decision, or even that state courts would make that decision, I think that's frankly inconceivable that an election would be decided in that way. And let me say, if you're a small D Democrat, not a big D Democrat, but a small D Democrat, it should trouble you that that's the means by which an election is decided. Uh, you know, I, I would rather that voters vote and have an opportunity to choose what they want to choose, um, and then we sort of see how it comes out. Is there a case where that provision should be used? Sure, but is this the one? I don't think this is the test case that we want to use. I think we have time for one more question.
Well, let me um, actually look even further ahead because it seems like coming off uh, Seth's point about um, you know, getting engaged, finding other candidates. Uh, 2028 is probably going to be a completely open field. And I think that's when you may well see AOC, um, Gavin Newsom, Gretchen Whitmer, a whole new class of uh, Democratic candidates, a whole new generation coming to the fore. And in some ways, the Republican primary now is maybe becoming the auditions uh, for 2028 if Trump kind of moves ahead. Um, who are some of the candidates, I'm just wondering, individually among the, the, the panelists that you're intrigued by going forward? Who are voices when people say, this is an election no one wants, who are some of the candidates you see on the horizon, potential presidential candidates who we should keep our eyes on or you think might be a force? Understanding that no one knew who Barack Obama was, um, you know, before, uh, really up to a couple of years before he ran, but just looking at the broader field, um, who, uh, who impresses you? Uh, Professor Vilar, let me start with you. Oh, but I don't have a, a, an answer, so let me... Um, yeah, I mean, I th one of the things that, you know, I'm, I'm among those that, that, you know, wish perhaps we had a different uh, uh, choice. <laughs> and, um, and I would be very intrigued to, you know, to learn more about the options. Obviously, I've read the articles that say who the, who the uh, um, you know, alternatives might be, but I don't have anyone at the top of my mind right now. <laughs> I have no idea. Okay, uh, both Jill and Seth are paid to think about these things. What, what do you folks think? I want Jill to go first. Can you repeat? It was a little garbled. Basically, uh, past 2024, it feels like 2028 is going to be a more wide open field. Um, you know, Biden won't run again or, or won't be able to run again. Uh, Trump may have, certainly if he loses, um, will not be there. So looking at the kind of prominent Democratic politicians who are younger and now the Republican field or other Republicans who might be candidates, who are the kind of prominent uh, politicians on both parties who you're intrigued with, who you think this is someone even four years down the road who might begin to shape the country? I, I think, you know, so, something interesting, you know, about the realities in, for 2024 is, you know, there's been quite a bit of speculation that Biden could still somehow decide to get out, not to run. And I'm, you know, kind of heartened that there, you know, there are a lot of good candidates out there on the Democratic side. And at least one of them, Gavin Newsom, the governor of, of, of California, has a politics, kind of the, the, the at least the, the strong building blocks of a national political organization if he were to jump in. And, you know, I, I, I I, I think the Democrats have have a good bench of younger candidates, both governors, uh, a couple of senators, uh, and and you know I think that that there is a bench, and that's a change. A couple of years ago, I remember a lot of hand wringing over, oh, it has to be Biden because we don't have a bench, and. On the, the for the Republican Party, you know, it, it you know it it's hard to see an heir to Trump emerging because Trump he's such a megalomaniac that I I don't think he has any interest in cultivating someone who would be his successor. You know, it's all about him and. You could see in the Republican debate, you know, the first debate, which Trump wasn't in, you know, a, a real split between sort of more what I would call establishment Republicans like Nikki Haley, and I find it amazing that I'm going to also mention Mike Pence at, in that, that category too, but... You know, and then, you know, the, the obviously 
there are the Trump clones like, you know, Vivek and 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 JD Vance, who, you know, wasn't in the debate, but you know, I think is someone to watch on the Republican side. Uh, and you know, I thought that that it was very interesting that Mitt Romney, when he announced he was gonna retire from the Senate, he went after J.D. Vance pretty big time, which is unusual to have that kind of intra-party public uh, ill will. Uh, and unusual for Romney, who always seemed a very genial uh, kind of political figure. But, uh, you know, I, I think that there are sort of rising, quote unquote, stars on, on, on both sides. And, and just to uh, uh, reinforce that, it's important to remember that there have been generational changes. Uh, Jack Kennedy was uh, perceived to be a, a generational change when he ran, and he was, what, 43? Um, uh, Bill Clinton was perceived to be a generational change. Uh, Barack Obama was perceived to be a, gener uh, a generational change. Uh, but the point is that, that those leaders don't necessarily emerge from a vacuum. Uh, they have to be identified, and then folks need to say these are the kinds of people uh, we want to have running. Um, and that then mobilizes the fundraising and mobilizes the uh, political activity that makes it possible for them to be elected. Okay, I'm going to give the last word to Seth Harris because he uh, wanted to talk about um, a project he's involved in that could also involve students. Um, can you do it in a couple of minutes? Hard stop, uh, believe it or not, for a Biden meeting at 7 30. So I, I may have to. Can we talk? <laughs> no. But uh -huh. I'm, going to, I'm going to shut this down completely. It will be too much fun for the group to listen to, believe me. There's nothing fun about a Zoom meeting. Who's kidding who? Uh, I'll just I want to add one thing to what everything Jill said, I agree with everything she said. The, the leading Democratic candidate in 2028 will be the current Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris, whether uh, President Biden is reelected or not. Um, there are also some other names she didn't mention, not because she doesn't like them, but because she just didn't happen to think of them at the moment. Pete Buttigieg, I think, will still be around. Governor Phil Murphy, Governor J.D. Pritzker, in addition, Governor Gavin Newsom, who has an ungodly ability to raise money. And I think he will be a, a leading candidate as well. So you have two Californians. What about that. Big Rich? Oh, uh, Gretchen Whitmer, I think, is a possibility. I'm not sure she really is interested in running. I've heard that she's not interested. But on the Republican side, in addition to the current candidates, although some of the current candidates are going to be done after this, I think Mike Pence, if he doesn't win this time, is going to be done with running for president. At least Chris Christie will be done. But there are some other names. Christie Nome, the governor of South Dakota, is very popular. And I would add whoever Donald Trump picks as vice president of the United States, to be his vice presidential running mate. And that could be anybody from Marjorie Taylor Greene or Lauren Boebert yeah. to Christy Nome or Nikki Haley. Because um, I think they will, I think they, my guess is the Republicans will try to pick a woman this time, um, uh, just for political reasons, not necessarily for, not for, for affirmative action reasons. They wouldn't want to do that. Um, so that, I apologize, John, for sort of my final word on that question. Okay, great. Well, thank you all for participating. It was really great um, uh, being able to have this discussion. And we'll be back next week talking about uh, the politics of abortion, um, which I think is going to be very interesting with people here from both the uh, pro-choice side and from uh, the pro-life side. So it should be an interesting conversation. Thank you all.